Aloha and welcome to the NFLRC Selecting and Adapting Materials for Online Language Learning and Teaching webinar. This project is funded with support from a grant from the U.S. Department of Education. For the past four weeks, we've been on a journey in finding and using new resources to help us teach online and share with our students. And we are coming to an end, unfortunately. This is our last week of the webinar series. This session will be a little different than the previous ones in that to start off this evening, afternoon, depending on where you are, we are going to have a panel discussion. And at the very end, I will be recapping what we've learned over some highlights of the seminar and recapping what needs to be done to earn the digital badge if you are participating in the quest to earn a badge. So I'd like to start off by introducing everyone to our panelists. So this afternoon, evening, we have uh, Katja Anderson. Katja is the Associate Professor for German and French at the University of Maryland Global Campus. She's joining us from Germany, so thank you for staying up with us, Katja. We also have Yasuko Tatyaka Browling. She is the Professor of Practice in Japanese with the East, language, East Asian Languages and Cultures Department, excuse me, from Wake Forest University. So joining us from the great state of North Carolina. Also joining us from North Carolina, we have Tina Wang Wolfer. She is an instructional leader and a conversation coach for the Mandarin Department at North Carolina Virtual Public Schools. And also joining us, last but definitely not least, we have Dr. Douglas Canfield. He is the director of the Language Resource Center at the University of Tennessee, joining us from the Volunteer State. Thank you all very much for joining us, panelists, and we appreciate your time. And go ahead and jump right into our discussion as I am looking forward to talking with all of you. To start off, I wanted to ask, and I'll put the first question to Katya. And Katya, what are your biggest takeaways from the series and presentations so far? Yes, hello from Wiesbaden, Germany. Um, it was a great review of ACTWIL's three modes of communication, interpretive, interpersonal, presentational, and the can-do statements. I was already familiar with that, but I really liked it that it came alive in this webinar series. And uh, when selecting and adapting resources for different proficiency levels, it is most important to focus on the task and not the text. That is what I learned as well. Uh, I like the task deconstruction checklist for designing interpersonal communication tests. Checklists are always good when you teach online. I teach German and French online with the University of Maryland Global Campus. And then um, new to me was the Lingua Folio, which is an online e-portfolio for language learning that helps students to set goals, um, track progress, uh, showcase their learning, highlight their intercultural experiences. And um, in a way, we use it already in our online classes because students prepare um, a presentation on their own life, where they live, um, they go on virtual field trips and present uh, what they find. And uh, with this uh, lingua folio, I have to explore that a little bit more. Um, but it seems that students can demonstrate to teachers and their parents um, what they can do in the target language. So I think that's a helpful tool. I was already familiar with the European um, language portfolio, and, and this is the, I guess, the American version of it. Thank you, and I apologize if my audio is a bit choppy. We unfortunately are having a little bit of weather here in Pittsburgh. I'm hoping that's not the cause of it. Um, I'll pass that question over to you next, Yasko. What are your biggest takeaways from the series of presentations so far? Is that my turn? Can you hear me? Okay, great. You're just great. fine. Yeah, great. So I have several takeaways, um, but let me just say um, I'm, I never taught online before, and so I'm here as a learner, and I'm looking forward to learn from each panelist and also from participants today too. And let me just say hats off to those of you who are teaching online, because there are so many things I never thought about before, um, like 
if you are teaching face to face, um, it's easy to expect the learning community form in the classroom because students get to know each other, become friends, and create the learning community. And I never thought of how it's going to be different uh, when you're teaching online. Uh, so class dynamics going to be very different from face to face. That's one thing I learned uh, from this webinar. And also felt the sense of conviction through this webinar series that um, I just have to keep, you know, using adding more authentic text in my teaching because as a teacher of Japanese, I think I share concerns with other Japanese teachers and maybe Chinese teachers as well that we feel it is difficult for students to, to read authentic texts with characters they haven't learned. And we have that sort of uh, fear of using authentic texts in a classroom. So um, two of the favorite phrases I learned from this webinar series was, um, well, of course, um, change, the change the task, not the text. And what Bobby said, um, lead with culture and language will, follow, language will follow. So I need to keep reminding myself of those two phrases and um, how I can uh, help my students to um, handle authentic texts in my classes. And another, another takeaway um, was, I think as a teacher, I feel I have to provide text to my students, materials to my students. I think a couple of presenters mentioned having students curate materials online. So shifting the responsibility from us, the teachers, to students so they can contribute and they can uh, learn how to uh, look for curate authentic materials uh, was something that I, uh, I learned from this webinar. Definitely, it is great to have some perspectives from folks who just teach face to face. It's good to hear that there's definitely some crossover. Um, it's actually funny, also, because Tina and I were just having a conversation yesterday offline about how we're concerned about using some of those authentic texts. Um, as you said, the key was that task, not text. And it's a good way to sort of push us a little bit out of our comfort zone. So, I'm not going to segue into you. If maybe you'd want to talk a little bit about sort of what we talked about, our concerns of using some of the authentic materials and some takeaways you've had from the presentation so far. Tina, your mic's muted, I'm afraid. <laughs> All right, sorry, I was on mute. Yes, yeah, so we, uh, we talk about using authentic materials. A couple of things I want to mention that one is, um, you know, as a Chinese uh, language teacher, I still found hard to find authentic materials, especially for novice level uh, students. Like I did a search on uh, infographic in Chinese uh, for the whole website, I found two. Uh, <laughs> so there's not many of those that has Creative Commons license uh, out there for us to use. We all know that how important it is to use authentic materials. So that's one thing I think we, we talked with Sarah about it. Another thing for Japanese, also Chinese, uh, it's a different language system, right? So there's not many similarities between English and Chinese and Japanese. Sometimes it's hard to, to uh, compare those materials uh, in, in our teaching. So uh, that's one thing. Um, so I wanna talk about the, my big takeaway take from this webinar. Uh, I definitely learned a lot. I, um, the presenter did a great job uh, explaining concepts and also giving examples. I love the examples. And Sarah, thank you for hosting all the webinars. <laughs> I know you put a lot of work. Thank you. Um, so my biggest takeaway for uh, is actually to have in-depth understanding of open education resources and the copyrights. Um, I often found hard, to, uh, often found I can't find the right image for my uh, Chinese coaching sessions. So with better understanding of how copyrights allows me actually to use certain resources and the website that I mentioned in the webinars, I have, I have found so many more proper resources that I can use to enhance my teaching. Um, another thing I did is I also share this information with my NCVPS uh, co-workers, our Chinese coaches in our e-learning sessions. And they also found those information very helpful. I'm sure they're using them now also for their teaching. 
Um, one of my students, uh, for example, actually asked me at the beginning of the semester, say, hey, can you find me some uh, uh, like podcasts? I have a long drive every day. Can you find me some uh, podcasts I can listen for beginners in Chinese? Um, so I did all my searches. I actually couldn't find any. Uh, until after the webinar, I went on to University of Texas OER website. After the webinar, I actually found a, a podcast in Chinese uh, for uh, a novice level student. So I was very happy to share that with her. That totally made my day. And it's just wonderful to see these suggestions and these resources that are being shared and reshared and given to our students. That is just so huge. So thanks for sharing that story, Tina. That totally made my day. It's just great to hear that we're getting resources like this for students. Um, I would agree the copyright piece is definitely always a big topic, um, especially in the online world where we're a little bit more visible and on display and more of a fishbowl environment, whereas a face-to-face -face tea drop and has a little bit more lead there. Um, so that was definitely helpful for me as well. Um, and I noticed that someone in the chat said that it was difficult to find even Arabic, Mandarin, Japanese, uh, especially for those language learners that are at the novice level. We want to use those authentic materials that can be hard. And the thing that Tina and I talked about the other day was scaffolding. So maybe superimposing some either simple um, scripts that students are able to read or um, so for example in your case uh, Tina adding the opinion so the way that students can sort of read matter and following the characters or so in our case adding basic hiragana or katakana and sort of superimposing those or adding them underneath uh, those authentic materials would possibly be a good way to just scaffold and allow students to use those authentic materials so thanks for recapping that conversation for us you definitely appreciated and uh, Dr. Campbell, welcome to you. And it's great hearing your perspective as well. Um, what are your biggest takeaways from the student presentation so far? Well, I have to I have to wholeheartedly endorse everything I've heard so far because those were all takeaways that um, I had as well. Um, I think that um, I think the interesting thing that I found was how everything seemed to be connected and interrelated. Um, the one thing that came to mind, we were just talking about OER and copyright. And although we had a session that dealt with that, it seemed like that was popping up in every single session as we were talking about kind of getting into the nuts and bolts of how these things were um, going to be created. So it was nice to see that um, that um, information was constantly recycled as we went through the different sessions. Um, the other thing I appreciated, although I am not a big fan of frameworks, I tend to bristle against them for reasons we can get into later, but I do recognize their value in giving teachers kind of a common nomenclature to work around innovating and creating new pedagogical frameworks. Uh, the one that came to mind for me as kind of I'm a teacher, but at the same time, I'm teaching teachers how to use technology. Um, the ALMS framework was a really good example. Um, I think that most programmers or people that aspire to provide technology to teachers hope that in the near future, frameworks like ALMS won't be necessary because we'll have truly open, platform neutral, easy to use editing tools and content. It's ubiquitous, everybody has access to it. Everything that we make can be um, consumed and edited using the same products, but that's not where we're at right now. So it's nice to have a framework to help us think through those concerns, um, but also not only think through them, but think what we need to do or what we need to ask for from developers to get rid of the need for those kind of frameworks. So um, those were really the two big things that um, I took away aside from everything else that I've heard, like um, concentrating on task, not text, um, making sure that um, I liked Kathy's piece about um, kind of like the cycle of um, curating content and um, 
consuming it, but then remixing it and making sure that that gets back into the OER ecosystem. That was something that really stuck with me as well. And Dr. Canfield, just to sort of segue a little bit on um, the cycle, um, what I was thinking about a little bit more related to that was the piece about the self-directed learning, how yeah. I feel that our industry, almost in education in general, is really going to be moving more in a self-directed and a personalized um, type of a medium. So have you found that in your experience, I'm not sure if you do course development, but do you find that you have a lot of more self-directed learners than maybe when you started? Well, and I think that that's something that has to be fostered because students um, do what they see. So if we're not, if we're not modeling for them the kind of um, digital citizenry that we should where, yeah, we take materials from OER, but as we remix them and as we um, repurpose them in ways that are novel, we should not be just holding on to them. We should teach students that, you know, when we do that, we need to, to let it back into the, um, we need, need to let it back into the OER wild so that other people can benefit from um, the kind of things we've done. Because I think that's the only way we push for the kind of um, curricular change that um, we are pretty sure students need now. Because I think it's safe to say in fact, Nina Garrett has said it on more than one occasion that um, it's not that we're doing things more or less effectively with technology, but we have to admit that students learn differently. And figuring out what pedagogical frameworks will help them learn as individuals is, is really important. So I would say that, yes, in, in my sphere, I'm I'm seeing a lot more self-directed learning, but it's because I'm modeling that, you know, this is how we learn. I mean, um, you can be the sage on the stage, but I think the more that you kind of adopt the guide on the side and fostering um, personal pursuits, I, I think that cements uh, an appreciation for the culture that they may not get if you're just kind of sticking to the culture that's found in a textbook, for example. Definitely. And just thinking about some of the different resources that we use now, um, as an educator, sure, I'm using uh, my material that's already set up for me and I use the Canvas platform. But to be honest, I'm sometimes using resources like Twitter and I'm tweeting things to students and interacting with them on that platform. So yes, absolutely, everything's changing with technology. And now through these webinar series, we're able to continue to grow and expand and change with it. So we're better able to serve our students. Well, thank you very much for your insights on that. Um, if any of our other panelists have any other final comments before we wrap up and go to the next question. Um, I would like to mention that uh, our university, the University of Maryland Global Campus, we already transitioned to open educational resources. We used to have textbooks in foreign language courses. Uh, then we fully transitioned to open educational resources. One important thing is to remember uh, you have to continue to research. You, even when, you know, in, normally you buy an, another textbook, um, here with open educational resources, you always have to be at the lookout, always do research, update, make sure when we are, for example, linking to materials, to make sure the link is active in order to prevent there is too much frusta frustration for students. Yes, I can certainly vouch the need to go through and check those links as sometimes they're dead and it's better to find them before the students get into them um, rather than when they're looking for them, when they're doing their assignments. So thank you for adding that in, Tatia. So I'm going to move to the next question. And actually, I think I'll start off with you, Tina. What do you see as the most important issues and challenges connected with selecting and adapting materials, and how should they be addressed? Uh, yes, yeah, Sarah, like I mentioned earlier, um, you know, we all know the authentic materials. That's really teaching our students to see the real duck, not just a rubber duck when you teach. So, 
So it's just like harder to find some the material some materials for certain languages. We I think somebody on chat also said uh, Arabic's hard to find. So I was thinking um, if there we can have maybe just you know my challenging is really finding the right material sometimes with the uh, copyright that's allow us to use online. So I'm thinking, um, I don't know how to resolve it. Maybe something already been there out there, I just not aware of. It may be a central database to actually, you know, categorize those by language, maybe even by level. I know we are not supposed to change the text and we need to change the task, but I think if we have a proper material for novice and intermediate and advanced, that will provide more input for our students. So that's just an idea. Uh, maybe there's some database out there already. So there definitely are resources out there. Um, OERs are a great resource, um, just doing simple searches using Creative Commons. Um, necessity is the mother of invention. And I think that as we continue on this path of online learning and continuing to grow and change with technology, more and more resources are going to pop up and more central repositories will be created and it will definitely make it a lot easier for us to find those materials and also have permission to use them. Um, you know, even what I create for students within a semester and sometimes even co-creating with them and collaborating with them, it creates new resources. One of the things that's on my list to do personally is that I feel I need to make the time to start uploading some of these things to these Creative Commons sites and making sure that others have the ability to use them so other teachers don't feel that they need to reinvent the wheel and can spend time working on other things. So that was a really good point. Um, Katja, I'll pass that question back to you. So the same question, what do you see as the most important issues with selecting and adapting materials and how do you think they should be addressed? Um, yeah. I was thinking the instructor's time for researching, selecting and adapting online materials. That's a big consideration. How time consuming is uh, the selection of OER? Then students' time on task. When we have self-directed learning of students, then uh, their time is precious as well. I have students that uh, live on four different continents and uh, some of them have families, some are US military active duty. So they have another life than just taking uh, online courses. So I have to be conscientious and uh, have to consider their time uh, and availability. And then um, one really very important issue besides finding open educational resources is the quality standards. Uh, what are the quality standards? Because um, I can, you know, when you look for some materials, you're happy to find them, you need to double check. For example, like let's say uh, YouTube video clips. Is the grammar explanation or the vocabulary um, well presented? Is it correctly done or is it just improvised? So I have to be knowledgeable in my field to select and be the one who is responsible for the selection. There is a lot to be said for that quality filter. Sometimes I get really excited because I see a resource and, oh, this would be great. I wish I could share this. And then I go through, dig a little bit deeper and, oh, this isn't quite right or this vocabulary word isn't correct. <laughs> there might be all kinds of issues with it. So that's definitely something to take in mind. Uh, the time the instructor spends, absolutely. We can easily spend a lot of time. Tina and I were just talking yesterday about how much time we've sunk into looking for resources and didn't find anything that's good. So that's a factor. But I also like that you look at it from a student perspective as well, Katya, because our students typically are very busy people with busy lives. Mm -hmm. Even at the high school level, there's a lot going on for our students and they need to spend their time wisely. So I would rather they spend their time with the content rather than chasing something mm -hmm. technology related. So that's a really good point. I appreciate you bringing that up. And a possible idea for quality standards would be something like the implementation of rating options for OER or awarding of badges to creators of high quality OER. I love that idea. And I think that as time continues to go on, we will see more tools like that where we can sort of rate and see how things are going. Dr. Canfield asking you the same question. So what do you see as the most important um, issues and challenges connected with selecting and adapting materials, and how do you feel those should be addressed? 
I think the biggest, we, we tend to be our biggest problem, I think. Um, I, I'm trying to remember, I think it was Steve Thorne a few years ago, um, wrote an afterword to a book where he talked about, we have all of these emerging interactive technologies that have the potential to really redefine um, pedagogical frameworks in language acquisition. Um, we've got um, innovations in experiential learning that are happening all over the place. Um, but his observation was that um, these new technologies often serve as digital reboots of earlier analog practices. So it's, I don't know how we escape at least starting out by teaching what we know or how we know how to teach. Um, when I think of this, me who hates frameworks, I think of the SAMR framework where it's, it's like what substitution, augmentation, modification, and redefinition. It seems a lot of times language teachers get stuck in the substitution, but never get beyond that. Um, so I think that um, we have to push ourselves really to um, think about putting together and offering our students new forms of engagement when they come together. Um, if there's a possibility for embodied communication um, virtually, um, I think that's, that's a very powerful tool um, for students. If we give them more embodied and more real world scenarios to work with and allow them to develop novel problem solving skills, maybe skills that we don't necessarily, we aren't necessarily aware of, if we're willing to kind of deal with I feel like sometimes teaching involves a, a fair amount of tolerance for ambiguity. If we can allow students to develop skills with language that we may not necessarily, or even digital literacy that we may not necessarily know about or be comfortable with, when we allow for that level of ambiguity, I think it fosters in our students an enduring interest in the target culture and um, it really cements some, some different sociolinguistic competencies. I can think of one example. Um, a few years ago, I was really interested in teaching a grammatical concept that was um, shown, there was a music video that I think really brought that out. And it, I, I was taken from a website that kind of had a, a macron at the bottom that was bringing up um, people's comments about it. And that, that lesson was probably one of the more valuable lessons that we had, had nothing to do with the grammar that I thought in the beginning wanted to happen. They noticed that everybody was texting. When they were texting, they were texting these numbers. Um, it was for a French class. And um, they couldn't understand, well, why are they dropping these numbers in, in the text? And we ended up having a discussion about how people were kind of geolocating themselves with department numbers. You know, it's like if I say I'm from 62, then that means I'm from this particular region in France. So we ended up having an interesting cultural discussion about how the French use the departmental numerical system to locate themselves much the same way that we might use um, state abbreviations. Um, so something where I thought that, you know, the important thing to learn that day was grammar got thrown out the window, but I think my students learned a lot more about something that they cared about um, much more than they did the grammar at the time. Now, honestly, at some point the grammar had to be um, learned, but I think that when we're, we're willing to kind of go with the flow with students, that I'm pretty sure that that lesson stuck with my students much more than the grammar lesson ever would have stuck. So that's just one example that comes to mind about kind of getting past ourselves and letting our students um, kind of um, dictate what's important to them and what they want to learn. I think there's a lot of truth in that. And I can certainly vouch that sometimes a lesson will take on more meaning, something related to culture, 
And I agree that those are sometimes the things that students latch onto. And as much as it's important to make sure that they're understanding their grammar and their vocabulary, they might need to make that connection. They might need to make that real world connection with what we're talking about for the whole lesson, the, the whole language to have more meaning for them. So I really love that story. Um, and I think that's another fantastic way of how sometimes technology can lead to uh, things we're not expecting and to just kind of roll with it and enjoy it for what it's worth. So thank you for sharing that story with us. Really good one. And then Yasko, I'll ask you the same questions. So what do you see as the most important issues and challenges connected with selecting and adapting materials and how should they be addressed? First, I really like what uh, Dr. Canfield said. I think we tend to underestimate our students' ability to handle texts. And yeah, uh, and we also have to remember to teach them strategies. Uh, I sometimes tell them, you know, you're not going to understand everything in this video, but focus on what you already know and use that for discussion. But um, anyway, so I'm, I really sympathize with what Tina said too, and it's very difficult to find um, texts for Japanese and Chinese. But I think um, when we have uh, the curriculum uh, based on cultural content and themes, and if we, if we focus on cultural content in uh, online resources, rather than looking for certain grammar and vocabulary, I think I have more success stories when I focus on culture content in a, a material rather than you know, the language itself. Um, one of the examples I have is when I was teaching uh, novice level, first semester Japanese at uh, college level, we had a unit on uh, Japanese towns and I looked for uh, there are a lot of Japanese towns that offers um, the promotional videos of their town with different, you know, uh, famous places and activities. So I, I had this video, a two-minute video of one particular place, and there are some texts in the video as the subtitles, which my students couldn't read. I told them, just focus on the message and activities and what you can talk about in Japanese. And we watched that and then use that as a springboard for discussion in you know, the elementary level Japanese. And I think students really enjoy that. So I just, I guess, um, remind myself with what Bobby said about lead with culture and focus on cultural content. And maybe that sometimes help us to find something that we can use for our classes. Lead with culture is definitely a great mantra for any world language educator as so much of what we do is based on culture and students really need to have that understanding before we can sometimes put the entire piece together, especially in the language that we teach in Japanese where politeness and showing respect is often a cornerstone of the culture. Students need to understand the why in the culture before they can successfully implement the how through the language. So that's a good point. And what triggered to, in my mind, your explanation was the bit about task, not text. I can certainly relate to sometimes students getting the fear in the headlights look when you're showing them a video and they're only understanding two or three words and they might get a little bit panicked there. But uh, by easing them out, just having them enjoy it for what it's worth and, and having that discussion at a level that they're comfortable with is a good way to kind of bring them back to their comfort zones so they're willing to engage with those activities. So that's fantastic. Again, thank you for sharing that story with us. It's a good idea to try to figure out some of those videos that we can show our students to get them comfortable. Really good. Um, and then Tachi, I'll ask you a question. Or, I'm sorry, I asked. I believe we're actually on to the second question. Um, so this would be the third question going in. Does anybody have anything to finish off with before we jump into our third question? Um, I would like to add, um, we were talking about real life situations and um, in my German courses, um, I have that unique situation that almost half of my students live in Germany and the other half is uh, lives in um, the United States. And so, they can exchange opinions, real life situations like taking public transportation in Germany. 
is quite different from um, life in the United States where you more often take the car unless you live in a city like DC or New York or LA. So um, the experience of taking public transportation, um, my students can really share because they have experienced it. And for those that live in the United States, um, we use um, actually as a good, very good resource, um, an online trip planner with public transportation, taking trains in Germany. And um, you have uh, that probably also in China or in Japan where you can go online you put a link into your classroom and then you can have your students plan a real trip. So that's a real life situation that my students enjoy. Fantastic. Yeah. And that's a great way to get the students involved and seeing how they can use what they're learning in class in real world situations. Dr. Canfield, you wanted to chime in? Yeah, I, I was just looking at the um, chats and somebody was talking about the use of screen sharing and um, in support of authentic materials and um, if we found it possible and helpful to lead walkthroughs through authentic mm -hmm. text and I can't tell you how important that is because um, we're actually playing around with um, with um, virtual reality headsets so we found out pretty quick that we can't just assume that students are gonna know what to do and the, the interesting thing was is that we couldn't figure out a way to have the um, teacher do a walkthrough because it was on a headset. So um, it was hard to do walkthroughs. It was hard to do um, kind of diagnostics if anybody was having trouble. We actually had a fairly intrepid teacher that ended up taking a headset home and um, kind of creating a video that she was able to show to everybody. Um, but um, we've, we've, we've kind of fixed that now. We actually have one of the headsets that we're able to screencast to a TV so that um, when the teacher wants to show the students what the expectations are, she can actually walk them through um, the scenario that they're going to be seeing in the um, kind of the virtual reality environment. Mm -hmm. um, so that um, it's a lot easier for them to kind of be familiar and comfortable with the surroundings. But yeah, I mean, I think that walkthroughs of any kind of technology or any authentic text mm -hmm. is very helpful because we can't assume that um, students are going to know how to operate. Um, mm -hmm. in, in and and that is exactly what I do when I uh, use this online trip uh, planner for students, I've created a screencast video to show the various steps so they know what they are doing. Because if we want to um, encourage uh, self-directed learning with students, then we have to be a role model. I fully yeah. agree with you. Yeah, and, and we don't want them frustrated. I mean, it's okay to feel challenged, but if, if we don't give them any direction at all, then they end up just getting frustrated and um, they, kind of think, well, I'm not cut out for this. Mm -hmm. So we want to avoid see, that, definitely. And what I also do is I meet with students um, via Skype. So if there is, if I sense there's frustration, I always say, reach out to me, I'm available. And we talk in person and that is very, very important. With online learning, to, we have like weekly meetings via Skype with our students and uh, they find that to be very personal because then it's not just a voice, not a computer at the other end, but it's a real life uh, instructor who cares about their progress and you can give individual guidance as well and practice the language. That human connection is so important in the virtual world, which might seem a little counterintuitive, but I find that when students have that connection to you, when you're sharing things with them, when they're comfortable enough to come to you with questions, concerns, it's a much different environment rather than feeling like they're on their own or in the silo working on this class all by themselves. They don't understand the technology and aren't sure what to do with it. But I love that strategy kind of me in Skype or other uh, forums like the Zoom, for example, and just getting in and working with them and walking them through things and just showing them how they can meet their goals and be successful in their endeavors. So thank you for sharing that. 
Um, we do have a few questions come in on through the chat, and I'm um, hoping we're going to be able to get to those, but I do want to answer the rest of our questions that we had planned so far. And this one, I think, is actually my favorite one. Um, Dr. Kenton, I'm going to start with you for this one. If you could add another presentation in the series, what topic or topics would you focus on? And what would be the most important points you'd make in that presentation? You know, I gave this a little thought. I would probably focus, I think we got a good, I mean, there were, there were like the ones where we were talking about the productive and receptive skills. I think we got a really good um, kind of granular look at um, some, some practical applications. I would probably focus on some of the more granular aspects of the things that for a lot of reasons we had to do a flyover on. Um, for example, I would really have liked to have a session where we talked about how the search engines in the OER repositories, how we can ask it the right kinds of questions to look for, I mean, I, I think we've heard two or three people talk about the frustrations of not being able to find anything in the OER repositories. Um, and I'd like to think, I, I know for a fact, Merlot's been around long enough that they've got what you're looking for, but sometimes it's a question of asking the search engine the right questions. I mean, even for the kind of things that I do where I don't expect there to be a lot of stuff like um, 360 videos or um, 3D objects or things that, um, you know, are not, not typical um, types of, um, of uh, content that you're looking for. I've still been able to find things like that, but it took a fair amount of um, creative question asking of the search engines. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one thing I'd want to look at, um, especially if we, we, we were talking about curation, about the um, kind of the productive aspects of that iterative cycle of um, curating materials. Um, I think the mindset for most teachers is what we can get out of OER repositories. Um, but like I said before, if we're acting as responsible models for our students, like um, we kind of saw during Kathy's session, um, I think we need to kind of run through the entire um, cycle with students and make sure that the creations that we make, make our way back into those repositories. And most faculty, even though they may be aware of some of the repositories like Merlot and Creative Commons, and they know how to get stuff out of them, I think if you were to ask them how they get stuff back into it, they would kind of give you the you know blank stare because they honestly probably don't know. So I think that is what I would like to see for a session is just kind of a walkthrough of um, how to um, get things out that you want to get out, but also how to get things back in, in a way that will help other people um, find those materials that are looking for. Absolutely. And I think having some guidance on how exactly to go about looking for things, maybe we're just not looking in the right places, not using the right keywords could be a matter of that. So that would be very helpful for sure. And uh, guilty as charged, I definitely need to spend more time uploading to resources like Creative Commons and sharing those resources that I create to kind of pay it forward and help out others who have helped me. So that would be a very good one to include as well. Thank you for your insight on that. Um, Yasko, I'm going to ask the same question to you. So if you were to present another presentation in the series or add one, what topics would you focus on and what would be the most important points you'd make in that presentation? Maybe you can guess by what I've said so far. I love to have a session specifically for teachers of Japanese and Chinese and other in you know, Arabic and in those um, languages with characters and how to um, look for appropriate materials, how to select, and also what kind of tasks uh, we can develop for each in novice learners, intermediate advanced learners. So some specific ideas um, would be great. That would be very helpful. And one of the things that I sometimes feel 
for example, as I was going through my teacher education, I feel that a lot of the world language material is geared a little bit more toward the students who are studying the more common level one languages, where they're going to be moving to that lab proficiency a lot faster. My students spend the same amount of time in the level one course, but they haven't made much progress on that ladder of proficiency because there are other things that they'll have to do first, like mastering a new writing system, learning entirely new grammar structures, lack of cognates even, has been very challenging for a lot of my students. And so it would be great to have a session where folks like us who teach logographic languages level four languages that are much more challenging for native English speakers to learn. I think it would be nice to, in general if, um, if more of the world language teaching resources were geared toward folks like us. And I think as our languages continue to become more common and as the internet opens doors for us, I mean, I can certainly vouch long ago when I was in high school and dinosaurs were roaming the earth and we were connecting to the internet through those old 56 modes. Um, I never could have dreamed that I would be able to be in a position where I'm teaching students online and teaching them Japanese. Online education just wasn't heard of. So as things go more mainstream, I also feel that as you know, students have more access to online learning, there's going to be more of a need and a desire to offer languages like Mandarin, like Japanese, like Arabic, Russian to our students. So hopefully as time continues, we'll be able to add more sessions like that. But I appreciate your insight on that. And as a Japanese teacher, I appreciate as well, just having more resources to continue to hone our teaching, especially for those students that aren't going to move up the ladder as quickly. So thank you for that insight. Um, Gretchen, I'll ask you that question next. So if you could add another presentation to the series, uh, what topic or topics would you focus on? And what would be the most important points you would make? Um, are you addressing it to me? Yes, Katja, I'm sorry. Okay, okay, I couldn't hear that. It's a little bit broken. Your microphone is not coming over to Europe quite as well. Um, yeah, what would I add? I think uh, creating rubrics is very important because when we are evaluating students' work, um, rubrics are essential. So what would be the criteria? That would be an interesting topic. And then another one, would be for me the e-portfolio, how to use it. Um, I know it's out there, but I have, um, I have used elements of it, but the self-assessment, for example, of students, so that they know what is expected of them at the novice or intermediate or advanced level. Um, another question I actually had, uh, I thought it was very interesting um, to see the culture cafe that is hosted by the North Carolina Virtual Public School. Um, I noticed uh, there was no presentation in German. Is that correct? So I'm trying to think, because we've had so many topics at the Culture Cafe, so many. Um, and I had one coach who actually, he was a Japanese coach, but he really wanted to do a presentation on Austria because he studied abroad there for a few years and he had a fantastic time I don't remember if he ever actually got around to doing that, but we definitely are open to a lot of different types of presentations, even if maybe they're not languages we offer at North Carolina Virtual Public School. Um, personally, I would just love to see more culture being taught in forums like this, even if it's not the North Carolina Virtual Public Schools Forum. Um, and it, I would definitely encourage everyone to consider maybe setting something like that up at your organization, maybe try mm -hmm. a pilot project and see if it takes off and gathers any interest because these presentations are huge for our students. They are great ways to help encourage our students to continue studying the language and continue to make connections with what they're learning in the classroom to those real world situations. Mm -hmm. So I definitely would want to see more of those types of presentations for sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then Tina, I'll ask you the same question. So if you were to add another presentation to the series, what would you focus on and what would be the most important points that you would make? Okay, uh, before I get to my point, I want to um to say, uh, Dr. Anderson, um, the Culture Cafe is also open to other teachers and professors to come into North Carolina Virtual Public Schools and to do a presentation. So if you have a, a German presentation, we're very welcome you to come to our school uh, to present that. Um, 
So I definitely I call. Um, I might do that. <laughs> right. Uh, uh, Dr. Kanfu and Sarah, you said you know definitely teach our our teachers and professor how to upload images and videos or send material. I will definitely help us to get to get more um, content into the area for all teachers. Um, so one area I want to learn more is really um, look into the differences between online teaching and face-to-face -face teaching. I think by understanding the differences, we can actually compare and adapt to each other. Um, for example, um, uh, Dr. Anderson said, you know, she's using a video to show how I do, right? In the face-to-face -face classroom, we can use body language or different ways to show, but you know, we, if we can compare those and really coming out, um, you know, this is what we do in the face-to-face, -face, this is what we do in the online. Maybe sometimes we can't not do it in the online space, but then what's the alternative? So have a really a discussion on those. So things worked well, like students, right? They do role play and they do pair discussions. So they improve their interpersonal communications by asking questions, negotiating meetings. How do we do that in an online space? I think one of the presenter mentioned to have a virtual uh, group so students can talk. But then the challenge is if they run into problems, how they get help. So things like this, I think if we can have a session, really go into it and discuss about it and to get you know, better understanding and just learn from each other's different teaching methods. Thanks, Tina. And I think that topic would be a fantastic panel discussion presentation as well. Hearing from different online teachers, hearing from face-to-face -face teachers, hearing from hybrid teachers and hearing about their experiences, how they overcome some of those challenges where the face-to-face -face is just not, um, it's just so different. So I think it would be great to be able to have um, you know, forums where teachers can share their experiences and their thoughts so they can learn from each other. That would be fantastic. Does anyone have anything to add before we jump to our next question? I would like to add that um, I have done all three. I've taught um, face to face many years, then uh, hybrid and online. And you can do almost everything online that you can do in person. The only difference is you have to really be really very well structured when you're teaching online. You have to think everything I had, we had learned about backwards design, uh, backwards planning. That's the same. You have to be very organized when you design an online class. You can be personal by meeting via Skype. Uh, also, students can meet with each other. Uh, they can, uh, if we use, for example, Doodle, so they uh, sign up for certain time slots. It's, it's all possible. It's only then also more time consuming. As an online teacher, you're almost available 24 hours, seven days a week. Uh, it depends on how um, enthusiastic you are about teaching. Then you can do it also online, what you can do in in a face-to-face -face situation. I will definitely agree that there is a lot of time that goes into being an online teacher as we're always on and needing to be there for our students. So I would definitely agree with that. Um, so I'm going to move to the next question. And while I do that, I'm going to try to switch to my phone here. We are getting a bit of weather here in the Pittsburgh area. So I'm hoping that my phone will be a little bit clearer. And I would like to start with you, Yasko, for this question is I'm really looking forward to hearing your answer. What transformations in your teaching practice do you see emerging from your participation in the series? Um, I will definitely um, give more responsibility to my students by, I really like, love the idea of having students curate materials um, so in the past, I've assigned um, listening journal to different levels of students, which is instead of publishers um, listening practices, I said, let's, do, let's work on listening skills for fun in Japanese. And students um, found on their own different uh, in, things that they are interested in. It could be videos in Japanese or audio could be Japanese songs, and they were reflections uh, regularly about what they uh, 
you know, what they listened to, what they viewed on their own. Uh, a lot of anime, of course, from Japanese students. But I think I can take it further by adding this curating idea. And if I um, assign them around certain cultural themes we are working on in the course, if each student find online materials related to the cultural theme, that's also to, of their personal interest. And then uh, collected them in maybe a blog with uh, material and their reflections about its materials that could help them to become independent, more independent learners, but also they can contribute to the course material, course culture content too as well. And they'll enrich the content of my course. So I'll definitely explore that idea in the future courses. I do love hearing that. It's fantastic to hear that folks from more of the face-to-face -face world are benefiting from learning from the online world and implementing some of those into their teaching. That's just fantastic to hear. So I appreciate you sharing our thoughts with us. And then uh, Dr. Canfield, I'll ask you the question next. What transformations in your teaching practice do you see emerging from your participation in this series? I think that because most of my teaching, although I do teach French, most of my teaching occurs when I um, have workshops for faculty. And I cannot tell you the number of times that I've heard teachers say, well, I'm not, I'm not teaching them technology, I'm teaching them Spanish, or I'm teaching them Japanese. And I think the things that I've learned from this series have cemented in me uh, a desire to, to help faculty see that, yes, they are going to be first and foremost language teachers. But I think that with some of the examples that I've seen, it will be hard for them to deny that they also, if they're going to be teaching online, they're going to be teachers of digital literacy and also target culture di digital literacy. I mean, if you're teaching online, I don't see how you get around that, nor would you want to. So I think that it's given me um, a, um, some, um, some ammo, for lack of a better word, to um, kind of help them to see that it's, um, it's important to realize that um, not only are you teaching language, but you're also teaching uh, on top of target language literacy or teaching um, digital literacy. Um, and, you know, they don't have to be the ones to um, guide their students through it alone. Um, I've got um, relatively, um, they're not Luddites, but they're, they're tech averse teachers but they understand that it's important. So um, I actually will go into a few classes where they want their students to produce um, a digital postcard about um, their, um, their culture project that they've had during the semester. And during the last week, I'll go through and I will teach the students that feel like they need um, the training um, how to use GarageBand or some other podcasting tool that will allow them to um, fulfill the assignment. And um, she gets um, just rave reviews about the fact that she cared enough to have somebody give them a tool that not only helped them to express their love for French or Chinese or, or whatever language it is, but also gave them a, a durable tool of being able to put together a podcast. So I think that that is the kind of modeling that um, I'm hoping to get teachers to understand is, is really important to, to um, acquire and to give to their students. I think that's probably the one huge transformation that will happen with me, especially with um, the teachers that I teach is making sure that they understand that they're not just language teachers, that they are also um, 
teachers of digital literacy. Definitely. And I think that's going to be a common trend, not just for world language teachers, but for every teacher. We really do have an element of digital literacy that we'll need to teach our students, especially as the world continues to evolve and change and technology keeps taking a bigger and bigger role in how we communicate with each other. So it's good to hear that we're better able to sort of get out of our comfort zones and say, okay, yes, I am a language teacher, but I also need to teach these students how to use some of the tools that they need in order to be successful, um, not only in the online classroom environment, but in the 21st century workplace in general. It's I think it's pretty easy to imagine that students will need to know how to do things like maybe put a simple web page together or create their own podcast if they need to do something like that. So if they're able to get that experience in an online language class, that's something that they can take with them to another job, something to post right. on their resume that they have experience doing those things. Well, so and that's I think fantastic. The, I think the line or the the boundary between um, face to face and online is 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 getting thinner and thinner. I mean, we'll probably get to the point where at some point, um, if your teacher has to go to a conference um, overseas, you know, you'll, I mean, I, I've got teachers that will kind of video in now. We're getting to the point where maybe 10 years from now, you know, a, a teacher is going to be able to hologram in to a class and teach it as if nothing had changed. They're going to be able to walk around the room. They're going to be able to point out students um, and all sorts of things. So I think as, as we start to blur the line between face-to-face -face and online, it's going to be important to um, kind of have all of these um, these these um, these frameworks and these ideas kind of fleshed out, so that um, you know if you're teaching in a, a traditional course, I think that even traditional courses have a fair amount of technology in them, and I think that's not going to get any. I mean, it's, it's going to get it's going to increase. I think we're getting to the point where technology is just going to become an integral part of any classroom, whether it be online or face-to-face. -face. Yeah, and I fully agree with that. Um, I used to teach face-to-face, -face, and then I used professional development opportunities and uh, learned about teaching online and uh, creating screencast videos, uh, everything that uh, will enhance the learning experience uh, for students to acquire language skills that they hope to achieve. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned hologramming in Dr. Canfield because I was actually having that conversation with a friend of mine a few weeks ago. I might be hologramming in within the next 10 years to help my students with their assignments. So very interesting that you brought that up. Um, Katya, I'm going to ask the next that question, same question to you. So what transformations in your teaching practice do you see emerging from your participation in this series? Yeah, this series has reinforced my teaching strategies, I would say. Um, and uh, I think I will start using elements of uh, e-portfolios, uh, include um, self-assessments of students and uh, encourage reflective learning. And um, initiate a, a collection of work samples so they can show what they have learned they can demonstrate their progress and then um, i might prepare more presentations on a variety of german culture topics i like the idea of the culture cafe and crowdsourcing so i might encourage other online teachers to do the same Fantastic. I must say I have used the uh, Linguafolio tool with my students at North Carolina Virtual Public School and I love it. It is a great resource for them. And I love especially that they're able to carry that with them. So I have students who start with Japanese one and now that we offer a level three course, they can carry that same e-Linguafolio, that self-evaluation tool with them through the upper level courses through Japanese three, maybe even beyond in university and just see how far they've come. Um, and related to what we talked about a few weeks ago with the self-directed learning, it's such a great tool that students can use 
the can-do statements laid out in front of them and they can decide where do I want to go? What's next for me? Mm -hmm. And they can set their goals based on that. So the eLingual Folio is a great tool. Um, just if I could give a little plug, I know the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction once in a while does do webinars on using the tool. So a quick search on the internet should hopefully bring that up for anybody who's interested in learning more about tools like the eLingual Folio or different assessment tools. Um, anybody's more than welcome to join those webinars. Um, they're a great resource for anybody looking to add some self-assessment into their courses. So and, really and I have that. I've used the European one in classrooms over here in Germany, but not yet the American version. So that is something to explore for me. It would be fun to compare and contrast how the two models are similar and how they're different and maybe come up with a hybrid someday that serves the best of both worlds. So really good. And then uh, Tina, I'll ask you again the same question. So what transformations in your teaching practice do you see emerging from your participation in this webinar series? Yeah, Sarah, one thing I say myself implement is uh, make my teaching models uh, student self-driven um, direct uh, by engaging them to form learning goals and uh, questions. So I'm very traditional. I come to the class saying, hey, today we're going to do this. This is our goal. So I tell them our goal, you know, what's the can do statement there. So I'm thinking in the future, you know, engage the students actually to look through the material, say what their goal is, what they, what they want to do. That way, I think that will be, um, they'll be more interested and more effort to put into the class to be more self-driven. One of the things I think I love the most about online learning is that it can be so self-driven and that students can very easily go in and dig and explore on topics that they're really interested in. They're not limited to that textbook that they're picking up at their school anymore. They can go online, they can use resources. And as we're now digital teachers, we can go in and guide them on how to use those resources like the eLingua Folio, for example, if they want to really take ownership of that learning and decide what they want to do next. So I, I think the self-directed learning piece is really important for sure. Um, and we do have a few other questions coming up from a few of our participants, but do any of the other panelists have anything final to add on this topic before we move on? been great hearing about some of the ways that we're changing our teaching practices as a result of this webinar. It's nice to see us be able to not only take the theory and absorb it, but then put it into practice. So thank you panelists for sharing um, your thoughts with us on that. It's definitely appreciated. So we had some questions come in. Unfortunately, I don't think we'll have time to get through all of them, but we had one come in from one of our participants and our participants, it's an anonymous participant who says, I want to create online drills where learners need to respond to questions by speaking and recording themselves. Any recommendations on online programs or portals to help us do that? Sarah, could you repeat the question? Certainly, and I apologize if that didn't come through clearly. So our participant says, I want to create online drills where learners need to respond to questions by speaking and recording themselves. Any recommendations on online programs or portals? I can't remember the name of the program, but there is a program that the um, National Foreign, not not the one in Hawaii, but the National Foreign Language Resource Center at Michigan State, I think it's clear, has um, a um, online tool that allows you to do that. And I, I'm going to see if I can find the name of it here really quick, but um, that's one that comes to mind that allows students to record and um, it's saved somewhere so that um, the um, instructor can go in after the fact and um, assess what was what was given. I'm going to see if that's what our our participants are chiming in that it is clear. So that might be a great tool to check out. Might actually be something I might want to check out from my classes, as I sometimes have 
um, lower participation rates on assignments that are like that, where we're asking the students to speak. So that might be a great tool for us to check out. Thanks for sharing that with us. And there's also Audacity. You can simply download when you teach online. That is what I use. Although our um, online platform, our management system, the learning management system that we use has already a built-in um, recording. It's only a minute long. So I use Audacity and that can be downloaded for free. It's very good and you can edit with it. So that's helpful as well. Yeah, and I'm noticing a lot of people are talking about VoiceThread too. Yeah. Now, VoiceThread is not free, but if your university already has VoiceThread, that's a, that's a good tool to use as well. Mm -hmm. I have used VoiceThread as well. Mm -hmm. That's helpful because you can upload a picture and then students can um, comment what they see. So it's good at the novice level, but also they can share opinions that would be more the intermediate and advanced levels. Definitely. Um, we also have someone who chimed in with Flipgrid. Um, that's a tool that I've seen model. They haven't been able to play around with that too much, but that might be fun um, to play with if that's something that might work. Thank you for that. Um, another question that we had come in, and this is one that um, is a little bit near and dear to me as I always have to make sure that I'm reaching all of my students. It's very important to me. Um, could you share some adaptations you've made to online materials that are shared with students for those students with exceptionalities or disabilities? When I use, uh, when I create a screencast video, I provide the text as well. So I do both. Before I create the screencast video, I think about what I will say, what the steps are, and then I provide the transcript with photos that I've used in the screencast video. I love the yeah. idea of adding photos too. And I think anytime um, you, any, any electronic um, content that you put out, um, if you just provide text that a screen reader can, can read, um, that usually helps the people that have, um, that, that, that are differently cited. So, you know, I know that that's something that we used for one of our students um, who actually was in a graduate German program and he had to have everything um, kind of converted to a format that his screen reader would be able to um, digest. So um, I think um, if, if you think to kind of add metadata to whatever you're doing that has um, kind of uh, the um, textual version of what you're trying to get them to do, I mean, honestly, for 3D and, and VR situations, it's not a whole different, it's, it's not much different from what you used to do back in the days of uh, MUDs and MOOs where everything was textual. Um, if you just um, kind of keep that in mind when you do things, then that, that usually takes care of at least the, um, the, the problems that can be resolved with screen readers. Definitely. Screen readers are very important to keep in mind, especially as we continue to serve more and more students with exceptionalities across the spectrum. Thanks for that. Another question that came in, and I think this question relates to folks who use uh, things like blogs or online discussion forums. And he says, I find it difficult to assess students' contributions to online discussion or blogs. Do you have any good ideas, examples, or suggestions? for tracking their contributions. Yeah, use rubrics. <laughs> Create rubrics uh, because then you as the instructor who is evaluating um, content and then the student knows what's, what the expectation is. So that is why I had suggested uh, rubrics are helpful to know what you do. I would agree. I like that rubrics make our grading criteria very transparent for the students. And Dr. Hobgood mentioned sometimes it might be appropriate to even give sort of an example for students to look at to say, this is what I'm expecting for this mm -hmm. assignment and you can model this based on this, but obviously don't copy. You want to reach out and, and share your own thoughts and experiences. Mm -hmm. But I love having transparent grading and I love that rubrics can provide that for the students. 
I often will encourage my own students to sit with the rubric before they're ready to submit and make sure go down line by line and make sure that they've covered everything and to contact me if they're not sure or they need some help on something to make sure they can really max out their score. So rubrics are a fantastic tool. So let's see, I have another question that came in. What do you feel is the biggest difference between online and face-to-face -face classes? So for a regular face-to-face -face teacher, what do you think would be the first step to make the transition into the online classroom? Honestly, take, take an online class. Um, I've always found that you gain so much insight from looking at things from the student's point of view. So, you know, there's, there's several, um, well, I think the, the, the trick is finding, well, finding somebody that does it well. Usually Coursera, if you just take one of the um, kind of super multi-user online courses, um, you'll get a sense of what frustrates you or what really motivates you in those courses. And that kind of helps you as you're creating your own courses. So yeah, I think the, the best thing you can do if you're just getting started with online teaching is take an online class. I would absolutely agree with that. It's a great way to get comfortable with what's expected and how one would interact with the online environment, how it's different between the face-to-face -face classroom versus the online classroom, how you can see firsthand some of the differences yourself. So I think that's a fantastic idea. We're just about to the end of our segment and I wanted to turn it over to the rest of our panelists to see if anyone has any final words or thoughts before we move on to our last segment. We're a bit of a quiet bunch. Um, I, I can certainly say that it's been fantastic speaking with all of you and just hearing some different perspectives from such a diverse group of folks and folks who have all sorts of different backgrounds and teachings and different experiences. So thank you all of you for being part of our panel. I think I certainly speak on behalf of everybody who is watching today that we really appreciate you sharing your thoughts and your experiences with us. So thank you for taking the time to join us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And Dr. Canfield's point about taking an online class first before teaching it is a very good one. You can also choose MOOCs that is helpful as well, because then you notice how you might feel lost in a big crowd. So the personal interaction is very important that when you post, for example, something we also had here, discussion posts, it's always great when someone is responding and uh, sharing their insights and it, it makes it more human, I would say then. I always tell people that as an online instructor, I feel like my biggest duty is being a great relationship builder with my students because we really do need to have that connection in order to help them to succeed and do well in the online environment. So thank you all very much.